Cher Ambassadeur Frieden, cher Directeur Frank, cher Monsieur Vassila, je tiens à vous remercier cordialement pour l'invitation à Luxembourg et en même temps de m'offrir cette possibilité de faire un discours aujourd'hui, mon premier discours en français, je dois dire, et de rester dans le magnifique centre culturel de Neumünster. C'est un honneur et un privilège d'avoir une telle opportunité. Je tiens également à remercier encore une fois l'ambassadeur du Luxembourg en Pologne, M. Konrad Bruch, pour le prix remis lors d'un festival de la littérature aussi important que le festival Konrad à Cracovie. Lors de mon intervention, je parlerai très brièvement du contenu de mon essai, mais je vais surtout aller au-delà et tenter de vous inviter à réfléchir sur le sens plus profond du Brexit et son impact sur l'Europe. Nous sommes à un moment intéressant où tout peut arriver, chaque option est encore ouverte, ce qui en fait un objet de tout fascinant. Leçon numéro un. L'Europe, après le Brexit, est plus, plus forte que prévu. C'est foot ma thèse dans l'essai qui a le surpris. Le Brexit a été perçu comme une crise existentielle pour, pour l'Union européenne. Nous avons tous associé le Brexit avec la crise migratoire et la crise de la zone euro. On pensait tous qu'on assisterait au début de la fin du projet européen. Nous voyons maintenant que le contraire est arrivé. La farce politique au Royaume-Uni est l'une des raisons pour lesquelles l'Europe a renforcé ses gouvernements libéraux et pro-européens. Prenons l'exemple de la France de Macron. Rappelons-nous qu'après qu le Brexit, tout le monde s'attendait à la victoire de Marine Le Pen. Grâce au Brexit et ses conséquences, en Grande-Bretagne, nous pourrions assister à un affaiblissement à long terme des forces anti-européennes. Nous pouvons voir que des processus importants sont en train d'être lancés, par exemple la coopération militaire renforcée. Cependant, les résultats les plus importants du Brexit pourraient être un renforcement à une clarification de ce qu'est l'Union européenne. Premièrement, nous savons maintenant mieux que jamais que l'Union européenne repose sur le marché unique et que ces quatre libertés sont indivisibles et intrinsèquement liées. Les Britanniques et le reste de l'Europe ont compris qu'il n'y avait aucune possibilité de briser les quatre libertés. Deuxièmement, nous avons appris que l'Union européenne réussissait bien dans les négociations. Ces bureaucrates étaient, étaient pour la plupart compétents et bien préparés. La machine bureaucratique européenne n'est pas sympathique, n'est pas sexy, mais elle est compétente, bien préparée et bien tempérée. Si vous comparez les négociateurs britanniques avec ceux de l'Union européenne, vous verrez la fossé qui sépare ces deux cultures politiques. Leçon numéro 2. La culture est plus importante que l'économie. Nous avons compris les fondements culturels du projet européen. On ne peut pas faire partie de la communauté européenne uniquement en raison de gains économiques. Ceux-ci sont sujets à changement. Ce qui est plus important est la conviction que nous faisons partie de la communauté de destin. Quand une nation a la valeur la plus élevée, l'absolu, il n'y a pas de place pour le projet comme l'intégration européenne qui relativise les sentiments nationaux. Dans cette lecture, une condition préalable à l'adhésion à l'Union européenne serait une autoréflexion critique. Leçon numéro 3. Le libéralisme n'est pas la démocratie, la démocratie n'est pas le libéralisme. La troisième leçon du Brexit sera moins optimiste. Il s'agit d'un échec de l'Union européenne pour développer une démocratie pan-européenne qui fonctionne bien. La démocratie européenne présente de graves déficits. Même si l'Union européenne a un Parlement élu, son rôle est beaucoup moins crucial que celui des Parlements nationaux dans la démocratie nationale. Bref, peu importe le choix du peuple, l'Union européenne va dans une direction plus ou moins identique. Vous votez pour la gauche, vous obtenez la grande coalition avec la droite. Vous votez pour la droite, vous obtenez la grande coalition avec la gauche. C'est ainsi que les gens cessent d'avoir une 
influence directe sur ce qui se passe. Les Brexiteers ont fait des efforts pour montrer que l'Union européenne n'a pas un projet à l'ADN démocratique. Et ils ne se trompent pas totalement. L'objectif du projet européen était non seulement de limiter les sentiments nationalistes, mais également de limiter les démocraties au niveau national. Cela se comprend après la Seconde Guerre mondiale, qui a été déclenchée dans une certaine mesure par un vote démocratique en Allemagne. Le vote du Brexit a démontré qu'il n'existait aucun lien évident entre démocratie et libéralisme, comme on le pensait au moins depuis l'époque de Fukuyama et sa thèse de la fin d'histoire. Je suis plutôt d'accord avec Yasha Munk, qui a écrit dans son livre « Le peuple contre la démocratie » que nous assistons à l'essor d'une démocratie libérale, d'une démocratie sans droite et d'un libéralisme non démocratique, ou des droits sans démocratie. Peu à peu, depuis 1945, les pays européens ont mis en place des systèmes de soutien libéraux, des mécanismes visant à défendre les valeurs démocratiques libérales fondamentales, ou au cas où les élections seraient remportées par des forces susceptibles de les mettre en danger. Premièrement, nous avons des cours constitutionnels dans toute l'Europe, un organe non démocratique très important qui dit ce qui est constitutionnel et ce qui ne l'est pas. La même chose peut être dite des banques centrales, un organisme non démocratique qui limite le pouvoir du gouvernement, gouvernement élu sur l'économie nationale. Un rôle similaire est joué par, la court, par les accords et organisations transnationales, par-dessus tout l'Union européenne. Cette perte de pouvoir pour les représentants du peuple n'est pas le résultat d'un complot d'élite. Au contraire, il s'est produit progressivement, souvent de manière imperceptible, en réponse à de véritables défis politiques ou la crainte que les valeurs libérales ne soient pas compromises par le vote démocratique. Mais le résultat cumulatif a été une érosion progressive de la démocratie. De plus en plus, des domaines de la politique publique ayant été soustraits à la contestation populaire, la capacité de la population à influencer la politique a été considérablement réduite. Le pouvoir législatif, qui était autrefois l'organe politique le plus important, a perdu une grande partie de ses pouvoirs au profit des tribunaux, des bureaucrates, des banques centrales, ainsi que des traités et organisations internationales. La montée du libéralisme non démocratique a son revers. La montée de la démocratie non libérale, comme on peut le constater dans, le, dans de nombreux pays européens, la Hongrie, la Pologne et dans une certaine mesure la, le Royaume-Uni. Les électeurs n'aiment pas penser que le monde est compliqué. Ils n'aiment certainement pas qu'on leur dise qu'il n'y a pas de solution immédiate, immédiate à leurs problèmes. Face à face des hommes politiques qui semblent de moins en moins capable de gouvernement un monde qui devient plus complexe, beaucoup sont de plus en plus disposés à voter pour ceux qui promettent une solution simple. Comme le soutien Yasha Munk, c'est pourquoi la seule façon de donner un sens à ce nouveau mouvement est de distinguer la nature de leur effet probable. Pour comprendre la nature du populisme, nous devons reconnaître qu'il a à la fois démocratique et illibéral. Il cherche à la fois à exprimer les frustrations du peuple et à saper les institutions libérales. Et pour comprendre son effet probable, nous devons garder à l'esprit que ces institutions libérales sont, à long terme, nécessaires à la survie de la démocratie, une fois que les dirigeants populistes auront supprimé tous les obstacles libéraux qui entravent l'expression de la volonté populaire, il devient très facile pour eux de ne pas tenir compte de la population lorsque ces préférences commencent à entrer en conflit avec leur. Leçon numéro 4. 
les médias sociaux apportent un, change, un, un changement fondamental dans la nature de la, de la politique. Cela nous amène à une nouvelle révolution des médias. Chaque révolution des médias a profondément modifié le système politique. Rappelons que c'est dans une large mesure la presse a écrit qui a fondamentalement contribué aux deux changements les plus profonds de, du deuxième millénaire de notre époque, à la réforme et ainsi qu'au qu développement de la nation moderne. Il est donc très probable que, que la révolution numérique produira des effets aussi graves. Nous comprenons encore à peine le changement en cours. Néanmoins, nous savons que c'était des Brexiteers qui, s'ils ne comprenaient pas les nouveaux médias, les, les utilisaient au moins très bien à leur fin. Pour la première fois de son histoire, la, la campagne du Brexit a eu recours à l'extraction de données volumineuses tirant parti du trafic sur les réseaux sociaux, des registres des électeurs et d'autres sources. Elle a également utilisé les médias sociaux à des fins de collecte des renseignements pour créer des profils d'électeurs détaillés et personnalisés. À l'aide d'un logiciel d'analyse, la campagne de l'IF a permis d'attribuer à chaque électeur des scores sur une échelle de 1 à 5 en fonction de leur probabilité de voter, de leur proba probabilité de voter pour, euh, pour l'IF. Ces données ont ensuite été utilisées pour établir des listes cibles pour la publicité numérique, la porte, euh, le porte-à-porte -porte et les contacts téléphoniques. Pour la première fois dans l'histoire de, des élections britanniques, la campagne LIF a développé une application interactive pour smartphone téléchargée par des dizaines de milliards de personnes, encourageant les abonnés à, à inscrire leurs amis, leurs amis et leurs familles à, à demander l'autorisation la, de vote LIF pour pouvoir accéder à leurs contacts via leur smartphone. Cette application offre un moyen supplémentaire de collecter des données précieuses sur les supporters potentiels du Brexit et de diffuser les messages clés de la campagne. Par conséquent, il est clair pour moi que nous devons intensifier nos efforts pour accroître le niveau de social media literacy et accorder plus d'importance à l'éducation civique. Autrement, les électeurs seront laissés à ceux qui savent comment utiliser leur peur et leur instinct de base. Mais en tant que personnage jouant le rôle du directeur de campagne de Remain, Craig Oliver, a dit à Dominique Cummings, le directeur de campagne de Leaf dans le film du BBC euh, sur Brexit, « Be careful what you wish for, you won't be able to control it either. » Faites attention à ce que vous vous souhaitez, vous ne pourrez pas contrôler les médias sociaux non plus. Leçon numéro 5. L'histoire ne nous quittera jamais, alors tout peut, tout peut être inversé. J'admire vraiment Francis Fukuyama et sa thèse de, de fin de l'histoire pour son courage intellectuel, mais nous savons maintenant que c'était faux. Pendant environ 30 ans, nous avons pensé qu'il avait raison. De plus en plus, des pays sont devenus démocratiques et ce qui ne l'était pas voulait le devenir. Cela a changé depuis au moins cinq ans. Mais le nombre de démocraties libérales dans le monde diminue. Il y a d'autres modèles qui sont devenus attrayants. Surtout le modèle chinois de capitalisme contrôlé par l'État. Nous pouvons maintenant voir que de nombreux pays qui n'ont pas clairement défini leur identité politique pourraient choisir le modèle chinois au lieu du modèle anglo-américain. C'est un véritable défi pour nous, Européens, qui croyons fermement aux idéaux de la démocratie libérale. Le fait que l'histoire n'ait pas pris fin pourrait être considéré à la fois comme un phénomène positif et en même temps un phénomène négatif. Cela signifie que nous traversons peut-être un crépuscule de l'Ouest, mais aussi que l'Occident peut se réinventer. réinventer. Comme je l'ai dit au début, tout est encore possible. Le projet européen peut peut-être inverser, mais le Brexit également. 
Au Parlement, nous avons maintenant un groupe de 16 députés libéraux démocrates britanniques qui travaillent dur pour renverser le Brexit. Ils sont intelligents, bien élevés et très motivés. Je travaille avec eux de près pour soutenir leur cause. Cela nous donne l'espoir que tout n'est pas perdu et que même si la Grande-Bretagne s'en allait, cela nous reviendra peut-être un jour. Par conséquent, tout comme cet abbé de Neumünster qui était à la fois un monastère, une prison et maintenant un centre culturel merveilleux, nous devons nous rappeler que l'histoire ne s'arrête pas et que nous avons plus de pouvoir que nous le pensons pour la façonner. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much indeed for those, uh, those five lessons and for sharing with us your, your experience uh, studying the, the, the Brexit phenomenon. Um, I, I think I'll maybe kick off with a, the first lesson you were drawing. Um, you said uh, Europe proved stronger than expected, plus forte que prévu, after Brexit, uh, and I would fully, fully agree with you on that. But I would simultaneously have a question there. Um, Brexit still hasn't happened. Um, and so in the same way as the UK economy has not collapsed yet because Brexit hasn't happened there either, could it be, could it be that the strength and resilience shown by the EU is true in the initial phase of the phenomenon, but do you have any views on whether longer term this strength and resilience can be confirmed, will be confirmed, or whether longer term weaknesses might emerge which we don't see at this point or don't want to see at this point? Well, I think that um, that the most difficult part, from the perspective of the EU, was the, the first phase. Um, so the, the the biggest shock, as you remember well, was was the day of the referendum, and um, and the, the 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 next days, so to so, so to say. So I believe that um, th there is no existential danger uh, connected to Brexit right now. Um, but of course, um, a lot will depend on the, the shape of Brexit, on the final shape of Brexit, whether it will be a no-deal Brexit or a close cooperation sort of Brexit, or whether there will be no Brexit. Um, but, I, but I think that the most difficult time for the EU has passed, especially if we speak about uh, the crisis, crisis of Brexit, because there are other crises that we can talk about, and um, they, are, they are still very, very um, important and might even be existential. But I think that, that the, the, as I say, for the first phase was, when it comes to Brexit, was, was the worst, and I think that the EU um, worked well during that time. Thank you. Um, I think I would, uh, I would very much agree with you also out of my own experience. There was definitely a unified reaction. There was also what I would call a very much EU re reaction. Uh, rules, institutions, procedures, that is the way the EU reacted and that is the way the EU functions and should, in my view, normally, normally function. But maybe to, to press that point a, a little bit more, there was a lot of concern at the time that, say, the, the liberal values which the UK used to represent inside the EU, uh, liberal in a economic sense, liberal also in a sense of, you know, evolutions of society and so on, um, liberal in a free trade sense. Uh, there, were a lot, there was a lot of concern that the departure of the UK might lead to a smaller EU that would be more inward looking, maybe more protectionist, uh, maybe less 
open to dynamism in you know, economic and social experimentation. Uh, now, of course, it's far too early to say, but what, what would you reply to, to those concerns? that longer term the EU might be changed in its character because of the UK's departure. But, yeah, but I think that uh, I, maybe because of the fact that they don't, sh they don't share these concerns, um, I think that the EU might change, but, but rather for, for, for better, so to say, because um, the, 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 co the cooperation between European states seems to be stronger after Brexit. There are other crises that are very uh, severe, I think, and we, we still have crises of uh, rule of law, uh, that is very difficult, I think, for, for, for the EU. Um, we, we still have questions to answer when it comes to migration crisis, of course. Um, but when it comes to the changes following um, Brexit, I, I see rather the pro-integration uh, impulses. Um, not, nothing really um, that would lead to uh, disintegration. Um, may, maybe an interesting question could be posed with regard to the Eurozone after Brexit, because the non-Euro countries lose their uh, allies, so to say, the most important one. Mm, so uh, it, mi it might lead to... Uh, so I, I think that the, 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 the one of the results of Brexit will be stronger integration around the core of the Eurozone, uh, so around the, the, the common currency. Mm, and this is dangerous for countries like Poland, for example, that firstly have this prob problem with the, the rule of law and secondly are not part of Eurozone. Uh, so I see danger here. So, so, so th there are some uh, consequences that are not, not maybe directly linked to Brexit, but, uh, that in the, but they are linked indirectly and, and uh, can lead to disintegration. But as I said, as I, said I think that uh, mm, the problems linked to the disintegration are not uh, caused by Brexit. Thank you. Well, I, I would tend to, to agree very much with you that there are other issues, other crises uh, that will put the integration process on the strain. And uh, if I allow myself a, a, an anecdote, I think you're very right in linking the Brexit issue with the issue of the Eurozone. Uh, I was told by former uh, British colleague uh, that David Cameron started thinking in terms of maybe, you know, doing a referendum and so on, etc. after a summit where he realized that he could not prevent the UK from being affected by decisions made by the Eurozone members for the Eurozone, and he was outside the Eurozone, and still he was affected by the decisions. It was the, one of the Greek bailouts. He was affected, the UK was affected, the UK contributed, even though he would have wanted to block those decisions, or at least be part of them even though he was not in the Eurozone. And apparently this realization that on important issues, the UK could be dragged along by the weight of the Eurozone while not being in the Eurozone was apparently an important moment in David Cameron's own thinking on, on the situation. So I think you're very, very right to, to, to see a link there. Um, if I may, maybe to, to another part of the, the subject, um, you're giving us an encouraging picture, and I, I'm very much hoping you're right, of course, uh, seeing Brexit as some sort of peak populist moment, uh, and that we have left that one behind us now. And so I would maybe here want to, more generally on the, the issue of populism, um, can one not make the case that some member states on the continent have their own version of populism, and so you have the, the British version leading to Brexit, but in France you have the Gilets Jaunes, in Germany you have the AFD, uh, you had Mr. Salvini in Italy, 
uh, you had the governability issues in Spain and so on. So, uh, I mean, to, to what degree are we right in seeing all that as the same phenomenon, some deep anger in society, and to what degree should we just see all that separately uh, and not see it as an European-wide problem? I think this is now the most important question uh, of, uh, of Europe. Um, and it's, of course, very difficult to, to answer. Uh, but I, I would say that I tend to, to think that um, this, these populist phenomenons, phenomena are rather similar, even if, um, uh, even if there are national differences. The big question for me is uh, whether Western European populisms are similar to Eastern European populisms. You didn't mention Poland and Hungary, and it seems that Poland and Hungary are now the biggest um, troublemakers uh, when it comes to, to, to the EU. Um, it's, uh, and, I, and I see very big differences between Eastern European populism and Western European populism. But when it comes to, um, to, to, those in, uh, to these populisms in, in Western Europe, I think that they, they are rather similar. So that they, um, normally the, the populist parties um, have in common this uh, negative uh, attitude towards uh, migration. I think it's true for all, all the populist parties. Um, they are rather liberal in terms of uh, in terms of uh, values, and so so most of them wouldn't uh, fight the, for example, same sex uh, at least civil unions, some in some cases even um, marriages. Um, here, here they wouldn't make huge changes. I think, uh, um, and this is a difference between Eastern and Western Europe, I guess. Um, what is what is similar also is of course that they present themselves as being defenders of the people against this, this you know, li li liberal elites. Um, so so I, I would say that that this is this is, this, this is these phenomena are rather um, are rather similar and um, uh, even if these countries are very different and uh, then also the degree of the, the popularity also the, the the narratives they use might differ. But uh, it seems that this is, this is a pan-European problem, not only, not only a, we, we, should, we should look at it from a pan-European perspective, not, not, not the national one. Thank you. I mean, in a way, this is, of course, concerning, but simultaneously, it does show the emergence of this famous European political demos uh, President Macron mentioned, and... Uh, which is something worth looking at in more detail, maybe worth starting to see uh, a more, you know, more similarities among the, the various political societies, also the, the member states, and maybe there are profound trends that affect all uh, populations in, in Europe. Um, and on that, you, you mentioned it as well, and I think it, it's very judicious as well, uh, the migration crisis. Um, I was extremely struck by the fact that uh, in EU terms and in EU law, we always distinguish very, very clearly migration is people from third countries, non-member states, moving into an EU member state. Uh, but if you have people within the EU moving, it's a completely different thing. It's called free movement. And I thought for myself that the debate in the UK was starting to go very, very, very wrong when that word migration was used indiscriminately, both by leavers and remainers, to describe really any anybody coming into the UK was suddenly a migrant, it was migration, and so on. And the distinction between the legal status is concerned, and also the distinction between the obligations which the UK government had under EU law, but which it did not necessarily have you know, regarding migrants from, from third countries, that distinction disappeared completely. And we, of course, then reached the point where the famous migration crisis, which was a crisis affecting the Schengen area of which the UK is not even a member, 
could suddenly be instrumentalized and used by political forces in the UK for its own purposes. Now, how would you analyze the impact of the migration crisis, and in particular, the, the peak which the crisis reached in the second half of 2015, uh, in the evolution of the, you know, the politics of Brexit and in maybe the result as well. I mean, how would you see that? Uh, I think that you're, you're very right in pointing out to this, um, this uh, mixing of, of problems. So the, the, the in internal migration uh, within, the, within the EU, so free movement and, and, the, and the migration crisis linked to the war in Syria mostly. Mm -hmm. It was it was linked by mostly I think uh, Brexiteers, uh, but but of course um, not only. Um, they were not very subtle, of course, in their analysis. Uh, they knew that they, they cannot be subtle because otherwise uh, um, they will not appeal to to people. And so I, I think it played a huge role, of course, in all the, all the analysis. Uh, I think migration crisis is is being seen as one of the one of the biggest, uh, of the most important reasons. So for, for this, it seems that um, the decision, especially of, of, of Mrs. Merkel, to open the borders might have also, even if I think that it was a, a good decision, uh, might have um, contributed to the to the problem and to the and to the result of of the of the referendum. I, I think that the, the migration crisis is, is the most. Important crisis in the EU, and most difficult one because it, it touches, I think, the, the, European, the, the, the identity of, of, of member states, of, of um, um, the, the European identity. It, um, it, it it produces a lot of fear, which is of course very difficult political emotion that uh, awakens um, populist responses. Mm, and, and I think that uh, it, it, it touches somehow the, the, the heart of uh, national problems right now, the problems with, with, with the question who we are, who we want to be. Um, it's interesting that, that the, 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 the most anti-migrant societies don't have too many migrants. Um, but, but, but it shows that uh, this question is, is very much linked, is very strongly embedded in... Uh, and the, the the way societies think uh, it's 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 very deeply there so to say so so i think that the mm, the, the the this crisis uh, is is much more severe i would say and much more difficult for the eu than uh, than than brexit and um, I, th I think that the eu sh still is looking for the right answer when it comes to the to the to to, to, to migration um, because uh, the these uh, the quotas proposed by the by the European Commission seem seem not to be accepted by the by all the member states now now there is even a consensus I guess uh, or, or the many states uh, agree with that uh, but on the other hand there is no solidarity and no idea how to create this solidarity and it's pretty certain that that first of all we will need migrants second of all there will be conflicts and Europe is still an attractive place so they they will be coming. We have for now these agreements, uh, which are working sometimes. They are stopping uh, the, the migrants coming to, to the EU, but it's, it's rather temporary, it seems, uh, and can be changed quickly. Yeah, so um, I think that the answer to, to migration is now one of the most important uh, tasks uh, for the EU in the years to come, so probably for the next uh, European Commission. Thank you, yes, I think I, I would second that. I mean, I think maybe one very last one before uh, we, we, we open the floor, because after all we don't want to be monopolizing here, but you did make a point which I thought was, was rather, rather compelling. Um, you mentioned the importance of social media and you mentioned in some detail how an, an app was used and how various ways were found to really focus or to enable the Leave campaign to focus efficiently on potential uh, hits, if I can put it this way. Um, but of course, if, and you, you mentioned it uh, from the BBC movie, I mean, uh, if Leave could do it in June 2016, uh, what happens to the integrity of our electoral processes from now on, anywhere? 
it's, it's again a very important question and, and difficult to answer. But the, the one positive thing is that we start, I think that we started to understand the, the role of social media and the, the way it can be manipulated. Um, it was used also, also, by the way, by, the, by to be um, to be honest, by the Remain side, but without probably, I think that Dominic Cummings was was much better at it. <laughs> that's the that's the that's the problem. But um, it, it is a big question uh, now. The EU, uh, I followed the last uh, plenary session in, in Strasbourg, and uh, the EU has uh, has, a, has a plan, as always, they have a plan uh, to to fight this information. And um, I think that, that that they have they have many good ideas. Uh, first of all, they want to they want to organize um, this media social media education. Mm, it's, it's, it sounds good. I don't know how it will work in practice, but 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 there there, there are four or five um, v very good elements in in the in the action plan um, implemented by the Commission. It, it will have to be, I guess, also implemented by the member states. Mm, I think it's, it's, it's a huge question, and, and the, the, I'm not sure if we can really um, we can really manage that properly. But it seems that now, now at least after Brexit vote, we understand the 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 the, 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 um, the scale of the problem. Uh, Brexit vote, I think, and then Trump election, in the U.S. I think these are two moments where where the use of uh, of data, uh, big data, was um, w w went very far, m m f further than in all previous campaigns. It seems. Yes, thank you very much. I suppose it's the difference between uh, throwing stones and having guided missiles, if I may uh, make that comparison. Uh, anyway, um, thank you very much. I think uh, maybe we should now uh, turn towards our very patient audience uh, and uh, ask if there are any questions uh, from, from the audience. Uh, now, don't be shy, but not all of you together, please. And to make a remark, uh, you all, both of you mentioned uh, Eurozone. The technical term in the treaty is Euro area. Don't you think that zone is already a qualification which has a negative connotation? Unfortunately, the French version of the treaty says zone euro. An Allemand is euro raum. So zone really for us Germans has a very negative connotation, it is the Soviet zone, and we don't like zones. Uh, so please, what do you think about this terminology? I, I th please, I, I do continue in uh, French now, uh, because uh, you, vous avez mentionné la vision libérale. J'étais au Parlement européen responsable de la rédaction uh, de la vie sur l'adhésion de la Pologne. Et euh, il y avait dans les textes de la Commission toujours le terme « il faut avoir une économie libérale ». Et nous avons systématiquement, à la Commission économique et monétaire, changé ce terme par « nous voulons une économie sociale de marché ». Est-ce que vous ne trouvez pas que ce terme est de nouveau à utiliser il a, il a fait le succès de la République fédérale d'Allemagne en progrès économique et il faut avoir précisément, vous ne le pensez pas, J'espère, ou je pose la question, est-ce qu'il ne faut pas vraiment reprendre le terme économie sociale de marché L'économie libérale, c'est vraiment de la raquillerie que nous ne voulons pas. Et maintenant, pour la migration, est-ce que dans le contexte, ne se pose pas la question de la façon de voter au Conseil Est-ce que les questions migratoires se règlent à l'unanimité À ce moment-là, le blocage du Conseil est prévu au programme ou est-ce que, je ne le sais pas, ces questions, peut-être à M. Frieden que je pose la question, se règlent à la majorité qualifiée, ce qui est le seul processus démocratique de prendre des décisions. L'unanimité rend un pays comme Malte aussi fort juridiquement que l'Allemagne ou la France. Et ça, c'est vraiment le contraire de la démocratie, à mon avis. Je... Donc j'aimerais bien entendre le vôtre. Merci. From today, I will only be speaking about uh, Euro area to, to avoid the bad connotations. Uh, when it comes to the social market economy, uh, I think it's, it's very right. We, we have that even, we, we took this concept, the German concept, uh, 
um, to, to the Polish constitution. Uh, uh, so um, it's, 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 it's the concept that, that is, is, is there, so to say. And, and I think that there is an agreement also in, between liberals. I think liberals have changed. I didn't talk about that because it is not the subject maybe of the... Um, it was not caused by Brexit, I guess, but uh, I think that the liberals have changed and they understood that uh, the this, this, this social element is also important from the liberal perspective. So the, 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 I think that most of, of serious liberals have um, forgotten about neoliberalism and uh, un understand that uh, there must be, a, the, the economists have to be more social. So, so for this, I think this, this idea is important and I guess that it's also important for, from the perspective of the of the people who make this decision uh, on the European level. I hope so, at least. Thank you. Uh, I mean, maybe very briefly to, to add uh, on the connotations, this is actually extremely interesting because, uh, I mean, uh, I'm, uh, I believe I know a few of the European languages, but I was not aware of this negative connotation of that word in, in German. Whereas uh, when you use it uh, in English or in French, it has no particular connotation. And it's the sort of thing, uh, there are lots of words like that, that in an environment of 28 uh, are, are tricky and we don't necessarily always realize that. Uh, on the, the other one, the, the uh, social market economy, uh, I would just add that in the, uh, the announcements made by the new uh, commission, or the designated new commission, uh, there is a mention of an economic system that works for everyone. And I think that's probably uh, new speak, it's 2019 speak for a social market economy, I would tend to think. Ah, yes, decision making. Yes, you're, you're right. I nearly forgot about that. Thank you. Um, well, I mean, this is now, uh, uh, maybe I should add here that the views I'm expressing here are of course a, in a private capacity. I mean, I, I really should say this to be on the safe side. But uh, decision making, the migration crisis is in my view an example of how decision making and institutional uh, structures can suddenly go in a way that was not originally intended. I mean, the, the migration issue, it's basically, legally speaking, it is reforming the uh, famous Dublin system on asylum. So it's reforming the European asylum system. That's the legal response to the migration crisis, and the Commission made a whole bunch of proposals half a dozen proposals to reform the Dublin system. Uh, the idea being that there should be more solidarity between the member states of first arrival, fundamentally uh, Greece, Italy, to a degree Spain or Malta, uh, between those member states and the member states further away geographically who are also affected and of course, we can only have a functioning system if there is functioning solidarity between those, uh, those various uh, geographies, if I can put it this way. Now, the rule in the treaty is extremely clear. The treaty on that is qualified majority. Absolutely clear, no, no doubt about it. But what has happened? The crisis shot up the political agenda it became, as you rightly said, the crisis, the one to deal with, the exist existential one. And so, of course, what happens in our institutional system with the, the top, top issues? Well, they go to the top, top table, which is the European Council. And so the European Council took it upon itself to go and do something about the migration crisis, and in particular, do something about reforming the asylum system. But of course, the European Council only works by consensus. And so suddenly, 
those legal texts that are subject to qualified majority voting got into some sort of limbo area where the European Council seems to say that it will deal with those matters and uh, by consensus. So I'm not saying that those texts have now legally changed their nature or that it is now a matter of EU law that they should be adopted by consensus, but it has become a matter of, I would say, political reality that they are unlikely to sort of return back to their normal procedural channel of qualified majority voting. And so we're having a situation here where the treaty rules are fine. They do not allow, as you say, Malta to be as important as Germany. Uh, but the politics of it have somehow caused the, the system to, to sort of jam itself, if I can put it this way, with the European Council sort of in the way of the normal uh, legislative machinery. Now, there are some member states who think that the European Council is the highest form of legitimacy we have, and so they would say, well, it's, it's not an issue, it's, you know, it's okay. Now, other member states tend to think that the community method of decision-making, proposal by the EU Commission, decision by the co-legislators, Council and Parliament, in the relevant conditions of majority defined by the treaty, that that is the proper way of doing it and that we should not you know, move away from that proper way of doing it. But it, it has happened, it is a reality. Um, but I, I'm speaking far too, far too long, so please, uh, the, the next question. I was thinking about the self understanding of Europe and whether Brexit might change that because um, we have had some potential models of Europe such as the economic model or possibly um, a community of values or possibly some kind of um, federal structure. These are different concepts of Europe. Do you think Brexit changes fundamentally the weightings between these different models and therefore um, the results of political activities. I, I think so. Yes, I, I think I think that it's it's um, it strengthens the the federal vision of Europe. I think because but the United Kingdom, of course, was was one of the biggest countries that was always against all sorts of federalization um, since always, and I, I think that it's, 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 it strengthens strengthens this 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 federal vision. Um, the, the, polit the, the community that is not only economic but also political. Um, so, so I think that it's, um, it, it influences the, this, this, this vision. But of course there's a, a broader question, we talked about it a bit uh, before the, um, before the, the conference, um, uh, on, the, on the future of Europe, um, whether, whether there are um, ideas, uh, whether there are new ideas or all ideas that, that are relevant right now for, for the future of Europe. And um, this is a big, a big question because I think uh, I, I tend, I like the, the most of the federalists uh, in, in, the, in the parliament, although mm, I think that um, they, they don't have too many new ideas. I think that the last person who had fresh new federal ideas was Jacques Delors, and after, after him, uh, the, 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 most of the ideas were already coined by him. Um, there is nothing really new, uh, I guess. So. It, it seems to be still a lack of, of, of vision, I guess, uh, here. So I think that Brexit could could, could ha help in, in coining this, this new new vision, but it's um, but it's still uh, a work to do for for European uh, for maybe for, for European demos more than for European institutions, uh, because uh, institutions are, are are more technocratic. There, there is one problem that I can maybe mention also here is that the, in, in liberal circles there there is there are two conceptions we can say that are quite popular. One is this federal Europe, 
The other one is represented by, by Polish, uh, former Polish Prime Minister uh, Donald Tusk, um, uh, President of the European Council, who had this idea already in, in Poland, but, but promotes it on the European level. Uh, the, um, not to have any vision. So his vision is not to have any vision, to, to re react to, to what's, what's happening. Uh, it, 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 was, it was called, uh, war, in Poland, uh, warm water in a, in a tap. Uh, philosophy. Um, if, if, I think it was good in Poland after the first uh, um, populist government. Uh, um, it, it was good that, that he had, he, he wanted to slow down the, the um, political changes uh, in our country, but um, it, it was not good during his second term and it's definitely not good for, for, um, uh, for Europe right now. Uh, so, I, so I think that th th there is a, a big lack of, 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 of bigger ideas um, on, the, on the European level. So that's something that, um, th as I said, is still uh, somehow work uh, in, in front of us, ahead of, ahead of us. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I would very much agree with your conclusion of work ahead of us. I think if you look at the immediate aftermath of Brexit, I think you can, with hindsight now, distinguish two lines of thought. There's one line of thought that said, ah, this proves that we've been going too far, this proves that the institutions have been doing too much, interfering too much. We need to go back to the member states, we need to de-federalize or de-communitize, whatever the word is. Uh, we need to you know, change course towards less integration. That was one school of thought. And then you had, of course, the opposite school of thought as well, which one heard probably less, but which was very real as well. The opposite schools saying, well, no, this, uh, this shows that we can't just have a halfway house. We need to integrate more to strengthen the common house. And this has to be our reaction to, to this shock. And I think if you look then at the political noise it was made by the ones who were saying, you know, this shows we've all been going too far. But the achievements on the ground were made by the other side. I mean, uh, after the Brexit shock, you had things like the informal meeting in Bratislava, uh, followed by one in Rome, and the idea of relaunching, the idea of strengthening. And so a lot of ideas have come about strengthening the euro area. Uh, a lot of ideas have come about the common defense and so on. And so I would argue that a lot of the actual work that has been done by the institutions uh, since Brexit, and partly because of the UK no longer actively opposing certain things, are in fact, I wouldn't call them federal, I, but you know, moving in a stronger integrationist uh, direction. Uh, so my conclusion would be the same as yours. There is still everything to play for from that point of view. I mean, the, uh, the ever closer union remains very much alive uh, and it's at this stage too early to try and say, oh, well, Brexit will, you know, well, if you remove a stone from under a wall, the wall collapses. No, that's, well, too early to say that. But it's also too early, I think, to be now definite and saying, well, now we are really going to integrate totally. The result might be somewhere in between, as, as always. <laughs> um, are there any other? Yes, please. Thank you for your introduction. I don't know if I'm as optimistic as you seem to be. Let's say it's because I'm a little bit older. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've seen this whole process of community institutions, all the procedures that's laid down in the treaties that were kind of deformed all in an intergovernmental way. But when I look around now, and look at the problems. Indeed, we do not know if we get a hard Brexit, how it is going to look after the 31st of October. It seems that all the countries 
are now starting to say we are prepared. Let's hope so. Um, I don't know where they get all the customs officials from in such a short notice, but... Job uh, vacancies. Uh, yeah, yeah. But there are many problems just looking around. You get a little change in an Italian government. Mr. Macron visits and two, let's say a president and a prime minister, suddenly decide for Europe we are going to uh, spread the migrants over countries in Europe. But when I see the list, there are many countries that are not mentioned at all. So who is Macron? In whose name is Macron talking? Now he visits Finland, says England has to produce uh, a proposal on the backstop in 12 days. Sounds like the 12 days before Christmas, but anyway. Uh, he says so, it, it may be valid for practical reasons. Um, we look at uh, Draghi, who indeed seems to say right now, we, Central Bank, we have done everything we can do. Uh, all our instruments are used. It's now time for the governments. Uh, in Germany, nationally, there is a discussion, austerity or a deficit to let the economy grow. The Dutch parliamentary debates is the same thing. We are very much involved in intergovernmental uh, discussions. And when I then look around to see that on the national level, there is not even agreement. Uh, okay. Are we going to be optimistic, realistic, pessimistic? Uh, I don't know. Thank you. I, I am optimistic in a restricted sense, so to say. So, because I th my, my, my thesis is only that Brexit didn't destroy Europe. I think it strengthened it. Even, even if no deal ha happens, it will not destroy European states nor the, the European Union. That, that was my, my, my thesis. But I think that you're right that the intergovernmental uh, solutions, uh, in, in intergovernmental way, way of, of um, making decisions in the EU is stronger. But I think it's stronger not because of Brexit, but uh, it's stronger um, to, to a large degree because of the Lisbon Treaty that, uh, that promoted the, 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 um, the, the intergovernmental uh, way of, of doing things in Brussels. Um, so, um, it's, it's true that, that it's maybe from the, from the perspective of someone who would, would want a stronger political integration, it is, it is not a good uh, development, but, um, and it's also true that the EU has huge problems. We, we talked about migration crisis as well, and, and I think that it's, as I said, I think it's an existential crisis still. Um, the, the, the same can be said um, about um, probably Euro area crisis and, uh, and, and a couple of other huge existential uh, challenges um, um, ahead, of, ahead, of, ahead of Europe. But um, I was optimistic in saying that uh, Europe is much stronger than we expected. We thought that it will, it will just collapse quickly after the first big crisis, for example, the, the Brexit vote. And it, it just didn't happen. It, it, it showed that uh, the EU institutions work, that they are actually stronger than the, um, the British diplomacy, that uh, the EU um, has its, um, so to say, political identity, that it understands what it is, that uh, we had meetings with the chair of the Constitutional Committee that is part of the Brexit Steering Group uh, in the European Council, and they were absolutely sure, the people of Tusk were absolutely sure that uh, there will be no unity at some point in the Brexit negotiations. Polish government tried to do a deal with Theresa May to show you know, that they are not uh, outsiders and so on, and, uh, but on also other governments. But none of, the, none of this happened. Uh, also, we, we are fearing, now it, may, it might be a problem, but we are fearing that France will want to kick out Brits uh, much quicker than they want. Um, none of this happened. So. I'm absolutely convinced that you are right, that uh, the challenges uh, are still huge, but I think that we are much stronger than it was expected, and uh, there are also very positive signs. That, that's what I wanted to, to say. Well, thank you very much. I would very much tend to agree with that last statement of yours about the positive signs and about the fact that, say, in this Article 50 context, the EU 
was extremely united. Why exactly that is, is subject of another evening, I would say. Um, uh, very, very briefly, maybe as, as a response, I would add that, of course, uh, those fields such as migration, such as uh, the economic crisis, the policies to face the economic crisis, were, of course, fields that were not historically in the core of what we used to call community law. And I think we do need to bear that in mind. I mean, integration processes take time. And if you remember the early days of the 60s, 70s, it took us forever to move away from de facto unanimity. Those are new fields comparatively for EU law. And that in those new fields for EU law, there should be still you know, traces of intergovernmentalism remaining. I think is, if you look at it long term, as people my age start to do, uh, I would say, you know, still the general direction of travel is towards doing more together. Um, but of course, it's not necessarily terribly fast. And it's not necessarily, you know, uniformly in the same direction. Uh, on that optimistic note, and unless there are further questions, I would like to thank you again very much for your expose this evening and, and your ideas. Thank you very much. And of course, thank the director for his hospitality here tonight. Thank you very much.